thank you so much. Thanks to Todd for having me here. Uh, I really appreciate the invitation and for trying the, the software here, seeing how this works. Um, I also want to thank the Institute for Humane Studies and its Learned Liberty series and Ozymandias Media for making my short film a reality. And I want to thank all of you for your time and your attention and your interest and support uh, that you're showing by being present here for the idea of human liberty. With your permission, I've put together a few comments uh, I'd like to share about the state and ideology and the subject of ethnic cleansing using the case with which I'm most familiar as the main example. I was impressed by the choice to pair my short documentary on the Trail of Tears with the excellent Soviet story, which is just an amazing piece. Uh, these works are, of course, about very different historical events. And yet, I would say they are different in degree only and not in kind. They offer us, I think, a similar lesson. Those who can, will. Where there is a concentration of power, a monopoly of power, might and not right will decide. In one case, in the Soviet example, such action was shrouded by an ideological framework that justified the removal, well, the extinction, of entire segments of the population. The mind just boggles. It's difficult to understand how the world stood by. Of course, it's easy to understand why there was no chorus of dissent rising within the USSR, we know what happened to the leaders. But the world watch, and that's something we have to come to grips with and try to learn from. In the other case, the Trail of Tears, the ideology of the nation, at least the one that was on the books, captured in such documents as the US Constitution, seemed diametrically opposed to what happened. This, I submit, wasn't a question of national ideology. It was a question of power, pure and simple. The citizens of Georgia and surrounding states wanted to possess what the Cherokees had. This is important to note. The election of 1824 was the first in which men without property could vote. They, and like-minded citizens, elected a man who was willing to use lethal military force to make this act of theft and redistribution possible. In other words, those without voted for might to take from others. And that's something that I think is, is relevant to us uh, to keep in mind ad infinitum. Uh, this could happen anywhere. There's a concentration of power. This is human nature, and this is what power makes possible. Okay, I'm not in any way attempting to draw comparisons between um, the Trail of Tears and the atrocities committed in the Soviet Union, but I don't think it's overstating the case by uh, viewing the Trail of Tears as an example of the international and ongoing pattern of ethnic cleansing. In 1994, a United Nations Commission of Experts defined ethnic cleansing as follows, and I'm quoting now. Ethnic cleansing is a purposeful policy designed by one ethnic or religious group to remove by violent and terror-inspiring means the population civilian population of another ethnic or religious group from certain geographical areas. To a large extent, it is carried out in the name of misguided nationalism, historical grievances, and a powerful driving sense of revenge. This purpose appears to be the occupation of territory to the exclusion of the purged group or groups. So if you apply this retroactively to the removal of the Cherokee Nation in 1838 and 1839, 
1996 definition fits. I'd like to check off the criteria and see what this tells us about the dangers of concentrated power and its threat to liberty. Certainly, the policy was purposeful. Far from being some sudden, spontaneous whim of the U.S. government, the policy of removal required long-term logistical planning, the purchase of new federal boats, the mustering of 7,000 troops, and the readying of multiple collection camps to hold detainees. For example, those uh, soldiers utilized the element of surprise when they captured the Cherokee citizens. Um, but the action itself was not altogether unexpected. Uh, the removal loomed on the horizon when the first Removal Act of 1830 was passed by the 21st Congress of the United States, and then again when President Andrew Jackson indicated he would not execute uh, the U.S. Court's decision in Worcester, New Georgia in 1832, in effect refusing to recognize or protect the Cherokee Nation's territorial rights against the state of Georgia. Removal became inevitable when the U.S. Senate, by one single vote, ratified the New Yachota Treaty in 1836, even though no official representative of the Cherokee Nation signed it. The treaty provided for two years uh, for the voluntary removal so it gave the U.S. government some wiggle room um, before they actually moved on enforced removal in 1838. The Cherokees as a whole represented more of a separate ethnic group than a separate religious group, if we're going to continue going down the criteria. Uh, when looked at with the U.S. mainstream, as Principal Chief uh, John Ross, uh, the Cherokee Phoenix editor and treaty partner uh, uh, Elias Boudinot and numerous others repeatedly pointed out, many Cherokees were by that time Christian, just like the majority of the U.S. mainstream. Their white counterparts. Much of the rhetoric surrounding and supporting removal was couched in overtly racist, uh, racist racial terms. Andrew Jackson's response to the removal act refers to savages, red men, and children of the forest. The first pro-removal essay to circulate in the popular press, which was in 1830, Removal of the Indians, which was written by the Michigan <coughs> Territorial Governor Lewis Cass, put it more plainly, setting it up as a clash between, quote, two races of men who yet divide this portion of the continent between them. Moreover, Cass exemplified the case um, with which many assigned broad and uh, undesirable attributes to the Cherokees and others, trying to make them as other as possible so that there would be a lack of sympathy for them, uh, calling them inherently less provident in arrangement less frugal in enjoyment, less industrious in inquiring, more implacable in their resentments, more ungovernable in their passions, with fewer principles to guide them, and with less knowledge to improve and instruct them. Not quite subhuman, but certainly inferior, right? The means of removal certainly were violent, going back to this original definition as the death toll, toll clearly indicates. Accounts of spouses separated from each other, children divided from their parents, underscore the terror of the roundup. Removal itself brought the additional horrors of starvation, exposure, and illness. By what terms were such experiences justified? One of the most potent was nationalism a sense that uh, it was the manifest destiny of the mainstream white U.S. citizens to expand, conquer, and remake the continent according to their will. With regards to the Native Americans, Jackson's claim, cl 
claim was that removal um, as part of this process was a necessary step in the United States evolution. It had to happen. It was inevitable. He says the present policy of the government is but a continuation of the same progressive change. The waves of population and civilization are rolling to the westward. So grievances and revenge may have played a part, but we have this idea of nationalism, which again goes back to uh, the 1996 definition from the UN. But I do want to go back to the idea that grievances and revenge may have played a part. In fact, something a lot of people aren't aware of, uh, General Winfield Scott was put in charge of this and he assumed he'd go down and make sure the militia members, the military soldiers had everything in hand and then go back to DC. And when he went down, he was so disturbed by what he saw, he insisted on staying because he said the Georgia militia members were looking not to remove the Cherokees, but to kill them. And if someone didn't stay and keep a firm hand on the Georgians, that this would not be uh, a, a question of just moving them. It would be a wholesale slaughter. So in that sense, there certainly were uh, strong feelings involved. And I'd say the Trail of Tears meets the last criteria for ethnic cleansing, the issue of territorial control, most clearly. The overt and obvious goal of removal was to transfer ownership of the land and all of its improvements, stores, homes, farms, etc., previously held by Cherokee national members into the hands of white U.S. citizens. This was a redistribution program. As a global phenomenon, ethnic cleansing has a history that expands far back for centuries, if not millennia, and stretches forward to the present day. As historian John Mac Farragher has pointed out, the Trail of Tears wasn't even the first ethnic cleansing in North America. That distinction belongs to the 1755 expulsion of the French Acadians and their Micmac allies uh, from Nova Scotia by the British government, which ended up wiping out over half of the French Acadians. <coughs> In fact, it wasn't even the first relocation project undertaken by the U.S. government. The Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Creek had already been uh, removed. The difference was they agreed to this, but that was, of course, under tremendous duress. Um, but it wasn't the same kind of military action that was leveled against the Cherokees. Then, of course, if we look forward, um, we could say that it wasn't the last. More than once, the United States has returned to forced removal as a national policy. The Long Walk of the Navajo Nation is an example, and more recent events, such as the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. This bears an uncomfortable resemblance to the pattern. The Trail of Tears was a watershed national event for the U.S. in two key ways that I think are instructive to us who are interested in the question of liberty. First, it signaled a radical departure from U.S. policy toward Native America, uh, all that had come before. It was a, diametrically opposed to it. This suggests this isn't part of the nation's ideology. Since the first administration of President George Washington, the primary position of the United States toward Native America was defined by what was called the Civilization Campaign. Uh, the, this campaign encouraged cultural, economic, and political assimilation and fostered Christianization, agriculture, trade, education, adoption of European institutions and Native nations. The most vehement champion of this, uh, Washington's Secretary of State, later U.S. President Thomas Jefferson, conceived of it as a great reformation, in a way, of both peoples, because he was hoping that it would bring the Native America into the United States. And he even offered wholesale citizenship uh, to Native nations. 
of trying to make assimilation happen uh, in, in a faster way. So as part of this program, the US recognized American Indians as the owners of the land on which they lived, with the rights to seed or sell these lands, as well as to retain them. As Jefferson explained to Native leaders, and I quote, we indeed are always ready to buy land, but we will never ask but when you are wishing to sell. When a British minister asked him about this, he said, uh, we consider it as established by the usage of different nations into a kind of juice gentium for America that a white nation settling down and declaring that such and such are their limits makes an invasion of those limits by any other white nation, an act of war, but gives no right of soil against the native possessors. His first introduction to the Cherokees came in the impressive form of the Cherokee chief, Ostinico. Uh, Jefferson's father frequently had Ostinico to their home um, when he came to Williamsburg, and Jefferson knew him as a distinguished guest in his family's home in Shadwell. In 1762, Jefferson also saw Ostinico deliver an address at the university that Jefferson attended, William and Mary College, before the Cherokee leaders set sail for London to visit King George III. It was not a leap to imagine that Jefferson revisited such memories then when accessing the feasibility of a joint future between all whites and American Indians. And he would write, you will unite yourselves with us, join in our great councils and form one people with us and we shall all be Americans. You will mix with us by marriage, your blood will run in our veins, and will spread with us over this great island. Now, part of this, his perspective on Native America, may have been influenced by his idealization of the yeoman farmer and the example of American Indians as a symbol of this a kind of noble savage in what he imagined was a pre-government state of nature. In 1787, he wrote, and we think ours a bad government. The only condition on earth to be compared to ours, in my opinion, is that of the Indian, where they have still less law than we. The lesser the law, the better the place. The European <coughs> are governments of kites over pigeons. Quite an interesting description there. To be fair, Jefferson tended to reduce Europeans to equally abstract symbols as well. He also wrote, I am convinced that those societies, as the Indians, which live without government, enjoy in their general mass an infinitely greater degree of happiness than those who live under the European governments. Among the former, public opinion is in the place of law and restrains morals as powerfully as laws ever did anywhere. Among the latter, under pretense of governing, they have divided into two classes, the wolves and the sheep. When contrasted with European wolves and sheep, the American Indians appeared in quite a good plight indeed. But forced removal didn't just mark an abandonment of previous policy, the civilization campaign, for example, and the legal promises made to Native America about their property rights. It also reflected a different view of American Indians. Rather than potential siblings in this larger you know, body politic, to be embraced and enfolded, it was remodeled after a European ideal along the way and the Native Americans became savages, even subhumans, in the eyes of removal era leaders. And this is no surprise, I guess. In a period when presidents such as Andrew Jackson and William Henry Harrison used their fame as Indian fighters in order to pave their way to the White House. To such men, Native groups as the Cherokee Nation represented the other, the enemy, a distinctly different way in then they came across to early founders like Washington and Jefferson, who in fact had them in their homes. 
as honored guests. The Trail of Tears also marked an uneasy transition in US political thought in general from Jeffersonianism to Jacksonianism. And I think this has relevance to us today. Jefferson's dreams for his fledgling country rested on an ideal, that yeoman farmer I mentioned earlier. Such a man embodied the ideas to which Jefferson was most committed. With his hands in the soil, he owned and improved. The yeoman farmer was independent and self-sufficient. He was tied to the land that provided him with food, clothing, and shelter. Owning and working his own property gave the yeoman farmer a vested self-interest in the new U.S. experiment of government. And it gave him a natural inclination toward egalitarianism and an equally fierce distrust of authority. He was naturally jealous of his rights and protective of them. In theory, his ability to provide for himself and his family made him an unceasing watchdog, ever vigilant against powers that might impose authority unjustly or expand power at the expense of individual liberty, even or especially if such forces were the state or national government. So Jefferson imagined this hypothetical farmer to be the citizen best equipped to ensure the republic would endure a limited state based on checks and balances, strong enough to protect the rights of its citizens, but not so strong that it might expand to become a self-perpetuating tyranny. Now, Jefferson's view did have its contradictions, not the least of which was the conflict between his value of individual freedom and his toleration of the institution of slavery. And Jefferson's idea underscored a pastoral, agrarian, rural idea that even at the time didn't represent the full marketplace, the full economy. And of course, it certainly doesn't today. But the pursual, pursuit sorry, of this idea required land and the need for additional land led him to follow policies with which he himself was uncomfortable. For example, the purchase of Louisiana territory in the absence of enumerated constitutional powers allowing him to do so. Interestingly enough, the Louisiana Territory also provided a place where the American Indians who would not assimilate could retreat from white influence and live separately in a place of protection, Jefferson believed. So removal wasn't altogether absent in his thought, uh, despite his rhetoric. So Jefferson wasn't always um, free of conflict in his own thoughts, and he didn't always act up to the ideals that he professed. He wrestled with those ideas where pragmatism and idealism collided. And in a way, the least consistent parts of Jeffersonianism led to Jacksonianism, this inevitable and possibly inevitable, uh, unruly child of Jeffersonianism. Many of the tenets of Jeffersonian thought, strict construction of the Constitution, laissez-faire economics, provided the backbone, it seems, of Jacksonianism as the first president partially elected by the common citizenry, he certainly expanded the idea of suffrage. But also added to this weird mix was his strong adherence to the idea, a potent form of manifest destiny, the conviction that the US possessed a God-given right to expand and control the continent from the Atlantic to the Pacific, his own record as a war hero and Indian fighter added this aggressive combat-driven flavor uh, to his perspective as well. Jefferson's reasoned anti-authoritarianism came from the intellect, from a comfortable established home in one of the older colonies termed states. Jackson's impassioned anti-authoritarianism came from the heart from the rugged frontier where he wielded a horsewhip against man and animal alike with as much practice as his law books. 
and held all privilege under suspicion. Jefferson responded to opponents with letters and essays. Jackson challenged his opponents to duels to the death. Nevertheless, both of them celebrated, in, in, in rhetoric at least, the farmer, the common man, the ideal citizen of the U.S. But Jackson's less sophisticated and more personal approach to leadership brought with it extreme paradoxes, with which we're still wrestling today. He attacked and vanquished the National Bank as a gross overexpansion of the federal government's powers, and at the same time, he cheerfully ignored the constitutional checks and balances of the system when refusing to enforce the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in Worcester v. Georgia. He assaulted the politics of established advantage and insider networks, and yet he turned around and founded the spoils system of patronage, patronage uh, rewarding loyalty in his own supporters and friends rather than rewarding merit wherever he found it. He claimed to be democratic. He also insisted that he personified the will of the people, that he embodied their ideas, much like Louis XIV said he was France. And this earned him the nickname of King Andrew I. Under Jackson, the imperial presidency was born reshaping the structure of federal government and concentrating power in the executive branch. The egalitarian movements that sprang up under his leadership, such as those for the abolition of slavery and the rights of women, had little to do with Jackson and his own ideas. He was both an unrepentant slave owner and an adherent of what was, even at the time, a really outdated notion of masculinity and chivalry. Hence that lifelong preoccupation with duels, uh, especially when devoted to feminine honor. The trail of tears brought these contradictions into high relief as leaders of Jacksonian movements, uh, Catherine Beecher Stowe, um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Thoreau, others, pioneers who championed individual rights and condemned unjust and unaccountable use of force, rose up and bitterly protested Jackson's policy of removal. The children of the Jacksonian movement, in fact, were pretty much uh, let down by their father, disappointed with the man who got the ball rolling. The history of the United States would continue to stray away from Jefferson's attempted and albeit not always realized, ideals to model Jackson's example. As the political became increasingly personal, the power centralized in the executive branch. Hmm. So the political is personal and power centralized to the executive beyond checks and balances. That, I think, finds us where we are now. If the lesson of ethnic cleansing, with or without corresponding ideology to match, to justify it, is that the concentration of power is dangerous, then we have our work cut out for us. To paraphrase the great journalist Isabel Patterson, the power to do for us is also the power to do to us. Or, as I said at the beginning of my talk, those who can, will. I'd like to leave you with a quote and a challenge from political theorist Jose Ortega y Gasset from The Revolt of the Masses. In this work, he applauds the classical ideal of liberalism, not to be confused with what we call liberalism today in the public debate and media, but classical liberalism. He explains that it is, and I quote, that principle of political rights, according to which the public authority, in spite of being all powerful, limits itself and attempts, even at its own expense, to leave room in the state over which it rules for those to live who neither think nor feel as it does. That is to say, as do the stronger, the majority. 
liberalism, it is well to recall this today, is the supreme form of generosity. It is the right which the majority concedes to minorities, and hence, it is the noblest cry that has ever resounded in this planet. It announces the determination to share existence with the enemy, more than that, with an enemy which is weak. It was incredible that the human species should have arrived at so noble an attitude, so paradoxical, so refined, so acrobatic, so anti-natural. Hence, it is not to be wondered at this same humanity should soon appear anxious to get rid of it. It is a discipline too difficult and complex to take firm root on Earth. I sincerely hope that despite human nature, limiting power and preserving human liberty and lives is not, as Cassette said, a discipline too difficult and complex to take firm root on Earth. We can only try. The Free Minds Film Festival gives me hope. And I thank you very much for your time and attention. Okay, if anybody has any questions, you can come down and there's a microphone up here that she should be able to hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So if you guys have any questions? Anybody? <laughs> but, hey, don't be shy. It'll be like yesterday. One person will ask a question and then like 10 more will ask. So somebody just has to break the seal. <laughs> no? She explained everything? All right, I guess you did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> I did that or everyone's asleep. <laughs> that could be too. It's, very, it's still early. <laughs> On Sunday, so okay. Then I guess we will. Sure, nobody, no questions. Last, last chance. Nothing. Okay. Well, I guess thank you for for joining us, Amy, and. Uh...